Acute kidney injury, or AKI, is the current term used for a sudden decrease in kidney function, or what we used to call acute kidney failure. After this presentation, you should be able to discuss the differential diagnosis of acute kidney injury in children, list at least three indications for acute dialysis, and explain the relationship between AKI and chronic kidney disease. We approach AKI by its anatomic site, prerenal AKI, is caused by impaired renal perfusion. Postrenal AKI is due to urinary obstruction. Damage within the kidney is intrinsic or renal AKI. Impaired kidney perfusion occurs with intravascular volume depletion, congestive heart failure, or other forms of shock. Postrenal AKI results from blockage of both ureters or the bladder outlet. Ultrasound or other imaging studies confirm this diagnosis. Intrinsic AKI can occur with any kidney disease. The most important causes to remember in pediatrics are hemolytic uremic syndrome, and acute tubular necrosis. Hemolytic uremic syndrome is covered in detail in the video on thrombotic microangiopathies. If poor perfusion continues too long, prerenal AKI can become ATN or acute tubular necrosis. A variety of toxins also produce ATN, especially myoglobin, hemoglobin, a number of drugs, and intravenous radio-opaque contrast. ATN may present with high or low urine output. Once the inciting event reverses, cells repopulate the tubules and healing can occur. Determining the location of AKI helps us with its treatment. Postrenal is easiest since imaging studies generally reveal the problem. With renal AKI, the kidney avidly retains volume to improve perfusion, resulting in high urine osmolality and low urine sodium. Urea is also retained preferentially, elevating its ratio to creatinine in the blood. With intrinsic renal AKI, these renal responses are compromised. The kidney is unable to handle filtered salt and water, which pass on into the urine, resulting in a low urine osmolality and relatively high sodium excretion. Kidney injury results in problems that complicate patient care and may require dialysis. Volume overload is the most common indication for renal replacement therapy. Metabolic disturbances, including hyperkalemia and acidosis, are other common indicators for intervention. We do not usually wait for uremic symptoms to treat AKI, since other imbalances usually trigger dialysis before these problems develop. If the underlying condition improves, the kidneys can recover from AKI. Even with ATN, the dead cells in the tubules can regenerate after days to weeks. The kidney may enter a diuretic phase, or what I call tubular stupidity, as it recovers from AKI. The damaged tubules, from whatever cause, cannot reabsorb sodium, water, and other substances adequately, and the patient may require a lot of fluid support to keep up with losses through the kidney. AKI clearly indicates an insult to the kidney. An episode of AKI may increase the long-term risk of hypertension, proteinuria, or reduced GFR. Renal function should be followed long-term in these patients. 
Normal living causes loss of nephrons. Up to 10% may be completely scarred by 40 years of age. Episodes of AKI cause more dramatic loss of nephrons, leading compensatory processes to kick in. These processes may stabilize overall kidney function, but they ultimately result in more def nephron loss. This vicious cycle continues until the kidney reaches permanent failure. Let's revisit our objectives and what you should know about AKI after watching this video.